Hello, everyone. Welcome to our web series, Fireside Chat with Champions, in which we interview global business leaders, asking them crowdsourced questions relevant to the biggest challenge you face today, COVID-19 and its impact on various aspects of business and the way we can steer ourselves in current uncertainties. Today, we have a very special guest with us, Dipali Khanna, Managing Director Asia at the Rockefeller Foundation. Dipali leads the Rockefeller Foundation's initiatives to convene and catalyze strategic collaborations that advance development in Asia, as well as harness Asia's role in enhancing the well-being of humanity in the region and around the world. She leads the foundation's flagship initiatives in India, Smart Power for Rural Development, SERD, which provided affordable and clean energy access to over a million people in India. In past, Dipali served as director of youth learning with the MasterCard Foundation, responsible for the global grant making strategy across more than 50 projects and managing a budget of US dollars, 800 million. She also held multiple leadership positions with Plan International, including country director of Vietnam and regional director for East and Southern Africa, where she led overall strategic planning within the region and managed operations across 12 countries. Dipali, a well-decorated professional with various awards and regularly covered by media and publications as it respected as Forbes, is an alumnus of Delhi University and the Harvard Business School. Thanks, Dipali, for accepting our invitation. I would request you to let our viewers know a bit more about you and your current interests and activities. Floor is yours, Dipali. Thank you so much, Deepak. And it's really a privilege and honor for me to be talking to you today. I've spent now over three decades in the development sector and, you know, in the slums of Delhi. Um, and I started working with NSF. That was subsequently, I started working for a local NGO, then moved over to what was my desire to really make a true difference in people's lives, because that's something that I had been born and brought up with. My dad was a farmer in when, you know, there were lots of refugees from Bangladesh who had settled in the nearby area. So that's when I got exposed to what it meant to be uh, a child coming from a poor family, what, how important education was, etc. So, you know, my entire journey started off from that childhood experience to what I did in my early years. And then subsequent to my role at Plan International, I had the privilege of working for a foundation that's MasterCard Foundation, which was, uh, you know, investing its resources into Africa, again, for children and young people. Uh, my work at the Rockefeller Foundation was very interesting and different because that was really in the energy sector. Now, there again, you know, I strongly um, uh, believed in that transformational change in people's lives and, you know, power work again enabled and uh, helped me to see the kind of change you could bring about in people's lives with energy coming into a village. So whether it was children's education, where they could study long hours in the evening or women feeling much more safer about doing their daily um, work or, you know, it was industry or entrepreneurs thriving in the villages, you know, that was possible when they had access to reliable uh, energy it was really something which was very important for me. Um, I think it was also useful for me to see how, you know, systems change can play an important role. But at the same time, there could be ways and means whereby you don't necessarily have to transform the entire system, but, you know, through a strategic intervention such as power, you could really, it can be really game changing. So that was all possible. I think who I am and what I'm doing is always driven by wanting to see impact and results and really be able to, in my personal and professions in people's lives. So I think that's what I've stood for. And I'm also privileged that my family and my children, my husband, they all support me and also have a similar bent of mind. Dipali, you have been doing fabulous work. So like, you know, I'm one of the witness of that. I keep on reading a lot of awesome things you are doing. And uh, especially like, you know, the initiative which you have done in India, believe me, the getting the energy or the power for those who don't have access to that is a game changer. So I, I appreciate that and thanks a lot for doing that. Uh, so that brings us to our first question. Uh, so Dipali, if you see that the economy is going through a serious recessionary pressure because of COVID-19 and subsequent measures like lockdown, this would dry up fund flow in the private sector, while the majority of government also seeing deficits in receipt of their revenues to taxation. What impact COVID-19 do you see on the social sector spending by governments, corporate social responsibility initiatives and other philanthropic funds? So Deepak, these are really difficult times and, you know, unprecedented times. We're really facing a global, global humanitarian challenge across every single country, every single. So the impact is definitely going to be not just 
short term, medium term, and long term. I think these are things we still need to figure out. Uh, the role of government, you know, and, and what, what it's going to mean in terms of what they can do for the social sector is also going to be a, a, an area where they will really have to rethink and repivot and reset because, you know, the kind of um, ability and the resilience that we need to build going forward is going to be absolutely critical. I think this for systems, especially our health systems, which need to be strengthened. If you talk to anybody who dealt with the Ebola crisis or the SARS crisis, they could tell you that we there was going to be another pandemic. Resources are going to be constrained, but how can uh, that those resources really be put to good use is going to really be important. I think what has really become evident also is the role of civil society organizations, the role of civic action, community-based organizations. And I think not just in India, but across the world, I think appreciation of what civil society actors were doing, community-based organizations were doing, had lost its relevance or importance, I would say. And, you know, again, the pandemic has shown us that who was really able to get to the you know, most affected very quickly, who had the trust of people with these organizations. So I think going forward, how can the government be really working effectively with, with these institutions that are really working with the poor, vulnerable and marginalized communities is going to be really important. And I know that there's the sector has to go through a lot of change. But, you know, they need capacity building. They need institutional support. So I'm really hoping that going forward, they would get a lot more support from the government on those aspects that really are going to be important for us to really be able to be responsive to the needs of our communities. I think when it comes to the CSR uh, funding, We've already seen through a report that FSG has done recently that there'll be a reduction of 30 to 60 percent. Now, even before the pandemic, Deepak, we know that most of the CSR funding was going into a few sectors, such as health, such as education and water and sanitation. But in spite of that, you know, our health systems didn't get strengthened. So I think this would also be a good moment for the CSR folks whose resources are going to be constrained to really see that, you know, if they continue to invest in the areas within health that they were funding, it didn't really build up strong systems because if it had built up strong systems, the systems would have been effective. So I think we really now need to be looking at how do we really work together? Because Again, I think the challenge is so humongous that we can't be working as a company or as just the CSR community, but how do we choose to be working much more effectively with government, with philanthropic organizations, with the private sector? So a wake-up call for the CSR folks to really see how they can now be part of this entire journey. How do we really work towards a long-term system change that is needed and where would the role of civil society organization the same point that i made for government i think are also important for the csr uh, people i think when it comes to philanthropic foundations again i think you know the ability for us to really be able to not just be looking at how much of our resources is going into programmatic um, work, but how are we building up these institutions that are really working directly with the people? I think over the years, that's been an area, Deepak, that most of us have neglected. We've also started criticizing that, you know, many a times the sector hasn't been effective, but I think there's a finger that's being pointed to us as well as to most of us saying, okay, we're only going to be funding program work. We're not going to be funding overhead costs, etc." Where would the civil society organizations really turn to for that piece of work is going to be important. I mean, data and technology, again, you see that, you know, there's so much of potential. Private sector has been using that, but have our civil society organizations been able to use that effectively? Not really, they haven't been able to. Who's building up the capabilities? Who's investing in that? So I think, you know, the resources are going to be scarce, but at the same time, the opportunities will be there for us to collaborate and work much much more effectively to really not each one of us be doing our own things, but how do we come together to really strengthen our weakened systems, whether they're doing it on water and sanitation, etc., is really something that we all will have to think about very, very strategically.
But that's awesome. Again, very well articulated, Vipari, uh, very well articulated. Uh, a small like, additional additional question to like, you know, what we just talked about. Uh, do you think that actually like, you know, post COVID, we are seeing that a lot of governments are becoming far more authoritative, even though those are democratic governments. Do you see that would also be a little bit of constraint for uh, civil society as well as the philanthropic organization to be more impactful? Because that collaboration with the government that you suggested, now I've seen that a lot of government, they are trying to be becoming more uh, introvert because they don't want the bad news to go out. So they're becoming very, very authoritarian. And that's happening across the, like, you know, you see from the developed and developing world world. Yeah. So do you think that would yeah. be a constraint a little bit of uh, what, what uh, you want to achieve? I, I think if it's not, a, not managed well, it could become a constraint. But I think, you know, how do we win the trust? Because many a times also if the government has been cynical towards the sector, they have had the reasons for doing that. So, you know, what we're really trying to do and how effective the sector has been, you know, I would imagine that the governments would be willing and wanting to reach out and work collaboratively rather than be more inward looking, because I think the challenges are so significant that, you know, it is not going to be just a government responsibility, but it has to be every citizen's responsibility, every group coming together and you know how do we uh, really make that happen so that we truly become allies of the government rather than because if we have to also start fighting with them you know that uh, dealing with all these challenges is not going to be helpful so I, I do genuinely believe I'm an optimist and I do feel that you know governments have a lot that they have to deal with. I mean, for you and me to really put ourselves into a situation like many a times we joke amongst friends and we say, what should the, what, I mean, we are finding it so difficult. I mean, the nights where we don't sleep and we look at all the challenges around us and how difficult would it be for our leaders who are dealing with many more issues than what we, you and me are dealing with. And how do we really be able to take an important role of really helping come forward and saying, you know, we really want to be partners and we want to be held accountable. I think one of the things that will also be important is that, you know, how do we really hold ourselves downward, accountable downwards to our communities, to our people? I think that is also something if we can really bring about a paradigm shift and really work with government and say, let's work, you know, we're not just the government, but also we as institutions, whatever, wherever we are in the ecosystem, but how do we together hold ourselves responsible for downward accountability and really for the people who we are trying to serve could really be a game changer. That's great. Uh, so that's bring us to our second question. Right. While currently everyone is focusing on containment of COVID-19 and its immediate impact, all activities currently are focused around providing healthcare support to those infected and providing relief to those impacted due to lockdown and loss of livelihood. Once the dust settles, which area do you see of priorities to the foundation and the CSR funders? I think, Deepak, I strongly believe that we'll have to continue working on our health systems because, you know, even now when we are looking at people responding to COVID-19, we have mothers, we, the infant mortality rates, the maternal mortality rates are still very, very high, you know, and we're ignoring all those things. So, right. you know, fundamentally, we'll have to continue to really see how our health systems are effective so that, you know, um, whether it's our villages, whether it's our urban poor, can really be able to get all the kind of services that they should be able to get from the health system, which is robust, which will have to be the need of right. the ER. You know, because, you know, I'll give you a simple example. Like, you know, you have, you watch Netflix, you know, when you get onto your Netflix account, it tells you what are the kind of movies you'll be interested in watching because they've been able to do all the analysis of your previous films that you watched. How, why can we not have a system where the community health worker just opens her smartphone or whatever phone she has and she is able to be told at risk or these are the 10 children or these are, you know, high risk patients because they're diabetic and they have high blood pressure you really need to be focusing on that so i think how do we now really use this moment to really strengthen our digital health system so that it's able to really um, get to identifying where the high risks are and also work 
work within the health infrastructure to make sure that we have adequate infrastructure uh, of healthcare professionals to be able to really meet the kind of uh, disease patterns, the pandemics of the future, I think it's going to be really the need of the hour. The economic recovery is going to be slow. You know, also, we will really need to now rethink with all the migration that's happened, you know, how are we going to be really looking at rural infrastructure? How do we create, you know, industry? Or, or do we expect everybody to be coming back to the urban areas? Is this a moment to really reset and decongest, you know, the cities and, you know, do more thoughtful planning so our cities become much more resilient for the future? And our rural areas, again, become more robust where, you know, you can be addressing the whole migration issue because we also know the risk of urbanization. We know about the climate challenges, etc. So, you know, this, again, will have to be an important moment where we're looking long term and really looking at both the rural infrastructure as well as the urban infrastructure. We we'll also have to be looking at jobs of the future. You know, and how are we really going to be preparing um, young um, people to be able to really take advantage of what the future would look like? You know, we've all seen working from home has become a reality. So, you know, there'll be more of these things happening. So I think, you know, we will really have to look at the whole way in which we've been looking at jobs, enterprises in the past very, very differently. So the health and the livelihood piece will be important. But along with that, you know, there'll be other areas that we have to focus on. How do we really build resilience in all our systems, whether it's our urban resilience or our rural resilience? You know, where does water, sanitation, where does power, you know, which has become such an essential service be sitting? How do we really ensure that everybody can partake of the technology innovations? How can our systems be much more equitable because I think what the pandemic has also exposed Deepak is the inequities we've seen how the poor and the vulnerable and you know if you're coming from a particular religion you're coming from a particular caste set a particular race set you know whether you are living in the US or you're living in India it's exposed all the weaknesses you know look who's dying whether it's been Europe or US or South Asia We know, you know, where the deaths are happening, you know. So I think this is really a moment also to really see how we're going to be building up a more equitable, inclusive society where everybody can thrive, you know, as opposed to a few people thriving and the rest just surviving is not going to be, you know, the 21st century that we all want to be a part of. So I think, you know, besides really continuing to work on health and um, livelihoods, we'll have to look at how data and technology can be put to better use for everybody. How do we address all the inequities that exist right now? How do we make you know the structures and the systems work so that there's more prosperity rather than for a few great so as you know that actually the COVID-19 will be creating a new normal for every sector every country and every individual how do you see you your organization and the society at large coping against the biggest disruption we have seen in our lives that's COVID so, you know, as an institution, again, you know, Rockefeller Foundation is over 107 years old. We just celebrated our 107th anniversary. And, you know, we have always been working towards serving the well-being of humanity. And we've done it for over 107 years. I feel very privileged to be part of the organization, which has such a rich institutional legacy, you know. And just in Asia, for example, in China, we you know, when I go there, I'm told, you know, we got modern medicine into China. We set up the first medical hospital, Peking Union Medical Hospital and College. Uh, similarly, in Thailand, we set up, you know, the Siri Raj Medical Hospital. We were invited here to address the hookworm issue. So I think we've had a long legacy of how we really you know, built the whole public health system and built institutions, built capabilities on the health side. So we definitely feel that, you know, we need to be doing more. Uh, we have obviously in the past been involved in the yellow fever vaccine development. We were involved in the Ebola crisis, etc. And, you know, we're trying to really see how we can now in the U.S. really beef up the whole testing capability. I'm sure you must have heard about what we're really trying to do, how we were trying to increase the test from 1 million to 3 million to 30 million a week. Similarly, we are trying to do 
something in India where we really want to be seeing how we can be working on the testing capabilities and scale up the work across a few cities in India. And we are in early conversations with a range of ecosystem players and hoping to do a pilot in one of the cities in India very quickly, where we are looking at how indigenously you can create testing kits, you know. So I think we're very excited about that work and how then can we scale it up. We will continue to work on our precision public health because we really feel that, you know, we really want to be empowering our community health workers to be able to have the right set of tools uh, because technology can offer that to them. where They really know who's a vulnerable mother, who's a vulnerable child, and how do we address maternal and child mortality by that community health worker being much more informed around where she should be prioritizing her energy. We also will continue to work on the livelihood side. So a couple of things that we're doing right now, we're working with Seva, which has 1.9 million membership across just India. They work across South Asia. And we've been able to very quickly repivot as to how we can get those women to be producing masks and PPE material. Because, you know, you've also seen that there's been a significant rise in gender violence as we speak, you know. And again, how do we really give women the ability to be able to get into productive employment very quickly and be able to get some resources back into the families it has been an endeavor that we tried through save us so we will continue to do more of that we also in the process of working with a few other funders to set up a liquidity fund because we also believe that the msme sector will need access to credit so you know that's again something that we at rockefeller foundation are working with other foundations and trying to see how we can provide this as soon as possible i know the government has provided quite a bit of relief in this area. But again, you know, there's our, our work is just a drop in the ocean, but we feel it's an important drop that can really help scale up the work across many other um, areas so that more and more MSMEs can benefit from it. Um, so, you know, we will, we will continue to do these two important streams of work that we are already doing. The third important stream of work for us is really working on our resident cities program. So we have four cities in um, India that we work in, which is Chennai, Surat, Pune, and Jaipur, where for many years we've been working with the city authorities to really see how we can have resident uh, city strategies in place and really address some of the critical issues that are so important for the well-being of uh, the survival of our cities. Again, with the pandemic, uh, we haven't been very effective in it because we've already, the cities have exposed the kind of risks that people have faced. So we will continue to do more work of that, around that. And finally, in that whole work that I was talking about data science and technology, we really feel that the private sector is way ahead the rest of the sectors where they've been using data and technology for decision making. And we really want to see how we can be beefing our capacities of the civil society actors so that they they can be much more adept in really embracing the new forms of data and technology to improve the way they function. We're also working with one of our partners, MasterCard, where we're working with the National University of Singapore to develop an executive education program. We're hoping later in the year we could be actually ruling out, rolling out to senior executives of civil society organizations because we feel, you know, if you really want to bring about change, you need to start with the senior leadership. We also have just uh, announced a 10 million challenge fund where we want to see how you can have more inclusive economies, you know, or using data science. So we're also trying to see how we can, you know, spark innovation. I know there are lots of challenges, but how do we really reset this moment to really unlock the opportunities and people coming forward with taking some risks? I think as a foundation, we look at our resources as high risk capital and something where we can put our uh, money and you know either we learn very quickly and we're successful or we can also if we fail we can fail fast and move on to doing something else so you know we will be continuing to be innovative and putting more resources around um, complex problems which don't have easy solutions because I think that's really the need of the hour. You'll continue to really work with unusual actors because that's another thing people we've seen that you know most of us have our own safe spaces and we just like interacting with that same set of actors that we've always interacted with. I think the kind of challenges that we are facing now really means that we need to get all the unusual actors who normally don't talk to each other uh, or maybe operating in different worlds. How do we really create that platform for 
the unconventional actors, the unusual actors to come together and really be able to appreciate and understand unconventional thinking and find unconventional solutions and really do some uh, path breaking work because I think that is really needed. Uh, last thing I would say is we'll have to be very, very agile and we will have to be learning a lot more. Um, it, the whole innovative nature, experimental nature of things will have to be tried and tested out a lot more. And I think as an institution, we are really trying to do that where we've reformed our own internal systems, how we were proving grant making, etc. Uh, you know, in the current situation that that would take a long time and that would not really yield the results that we were looking for. So I think we are continuing to evolve as an organization. I think most importantly, what all of us need to keep in mind is the end customer or the end consumer or the end beneficiary, that person that we are really trying to serve. And if we're really working, most of us, you know, in the development sector are really keep working for the well-being of the poor, marginalized communities. So how are we in everything that we are doing, really keeping them in the center of all that we are trying to do and, you know, really listening to them? Because I think we're all well-intentioned people, but our world is not necessarily the world they're living in. And, you know, the more we can listen to them, the more we can interact with them, the more we can communicate with them and get a direct sense of what really they're experiencing, what they want to be doing in the future so that, you know, we are not, you know, creating something which has no relevance to them. I mean, that will be a real disaster. So in all this that we're trying to do, really work with them and keep them in the center of everything that we're trying to do. That's great. And in fact, like, you know, one thing which was very surprising to me also was like, you know, the agility of uh, the typically the philanthropic uh, organizations. Uh, you'll be surprised in last uh, 40 odd days, I have received a lot of uh, messages, a lot of uh, contacts from uh, those organizations. They are very keen to do the digital transformation as soon as possible. And uh, uh, some of them, they were very keen that, can you do it pro bono? I said, yes, all, all in, no problem. This is this is tough time and, and we need to help each other out. So I, I, I believe like, you know, that is the, the, the sweetest thing I saw is that the people in this uh, social sector, they are very, very agile in adopting they have seen that actually like, you know, where the private sector has been having a little bit lead, those things can now be also be adopted by the social sector. And that was something very, very hard thing to see. Uh, and, and again, there's a, always Rockefeller has been doing things which are tremendously important. And the most important thing is that they are saving lives. So that's very, very important. Uh, now we come to the last section of our discussion. Here actually we are looking for uh, the silver bullets, the advice from you for those entrepreneurs, startups, which are actually working in social impact areas. And at the same time also, uh, some advice to the investors and the funders, uh, where they should be a little bit time saying that more pragmatic in supporting these type of institution. You've already given an example of you coming out with the $10 million funds. What would be your advice to the, as I said, the startup as well as the investors? So I think for the startups, again, I have a lot of respect for what they're doing. And, you know, we need more of you rather than less of you. Uh, my um, uh, advice, you know, would be, uh, as I was mentioning previously, is really um, try and keep the interest of the people that you're trying to serve uppermost in everything that you're trying to do. Don't presume anything. I think it's constantly good to kind of recheck and, you know, have ways and measures of how you're taking stock or doing a reality check so that, you know, you're really responding to a real need as opposed to a perceived need. Um, that'll really be important. Um, I think, um, you know, uh, also, um, how can you be um, more collaborative? I, I think you guys, um, because of your survival mode and survival instincts and how you operate, it's a safe space for you. But the more you can collaborate with each other and, uh, you know, uh, uh, being competitive is good. But at the same time, I think collaboration is also important. So, you know, you would benefit from, from that because we as a, you know, as a sector really benefit from that. Um, I guess the rest of it is, you know, lot, lots of respect for everything that you do. I guess for the others, I would say that, you know, um, be as agile because obviously, um, you know, the social entrepreneurs, work at a pace where they want decisions quickly. So how are we going to be transforming 
our systems, et cetera, and be able to work at a pace which is really needed for the social entrepreneurs to be able to be effective is going to be important. Or also, you know, how do we um, work together to have more common metrics of how and what we are looking for? Because I think with each one of us having our own sets of mechanisms of how we do due diligence, how we want to be seeing impact and results, I think if there's a more harmonized way, it could be easier for the social entrepreneurs. Uh, so I think there's obviously work that we can do um, in, in terms of becoming much more effective and responsive. Um, I think, um, uh, you know, innovation, um, we, uh, we as foundations do all subscribe to innovation. So it's also like, how do we really walk the talk? when we are really working with the social entrepreneurs who truly are innovative in nature and everything that they do then, you know, um, needs to be done in, in a certain way. So I think there's a lot that we can learn from each other. It's, it's not a one way process, but really a two way process. The more we engage in more platforms we have as social entrepreneurs and the rest of us can come together could be really useful. And I'm glad that, you know, Deepak, you're making an effort as well to make that, you know create that bridge as well so i think you know it'll also be useful with uh, us hearing from the social entrepreneurs what they really need from us and uh, how do we then all come together and say okay you know these are the one or two things that we're going to start doing differently because i think we can say what we say but you know real action is is really the need of the hour so i want to thank you for you know this conversation and hopefully you know this is not going to be the end of it but we'll start up many more conversations for many more people to be on a journey where all of us at the end of the day really aspire to bring about change in our own ways. And, you know, if we can just be much more effective in getting all that together, I think the end result would be even better. Thank you, Deepak. In fact, I should be thanking you for giving the time. And I love one thing which you said that be competitive, but collaborate. In fact, you know, there is a, something called business canvas, right? Most of the startup, they put that the competition, they put their actors, they put their expenses. Believe me, the first thing uh, I did uh, in the first meeting after we did virtually with our team, I think it was 10th or 12th day after the lockdown, I said, please, all of you, we all have the canvas. We always, each one of my team sees every day that canvas. I said, please strike that off the competition. Now we have to collaborate. So whether it's a crop in or I grow, each of the organization which we used to see as our competition, I reached out to them and I said that, guys, I'm having some strength. You have some strength. Let's collaborate. And end of the day, the focus need to be delivering the value because now going forward, all the startup, they would be assessed on their impact and value, not on about how much investment we have raised. So let's now focus on the crux, that's value. And uh, people like you motivate us a lot, uh, for sure. And uh, I've been following you, the work you are doing is, has been tremendous. And that has been like, you know, in fact, I was very surprised. I was not aware about the work you have done for uh, getting the electrification and the like, you know, light for the rural areas, right? When I read about that project, like it opened my eyes that, you know, when you target millions of people, the challenges have gone through it. And then you're achieving such a big milestone. And that's a motivation for a lot of us when we say that actually we would like to impact a million lives, right? We saw that somebody has achieved that. So we can also do that. So like, you know, thanks for being our motivation. Dipali, you have been an awesome guest and uh, thanks a lot for your time. Uh, look forward to work with you and uh, impact lives of people. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.